Okay, hello and welcome. Just waiting for someone to come into the room. Hello, welcome to our pre Shabbat inspiration for this very special Parsha of Lech Lecha. Um, Lech Lecha introduces to us the ancestor of the Jewish people, Abraham. God reveals himself to Abraham. He tells him to go to a land which, will be, which he will show to him. And Abraham, who is 75 years old, at that time he's called Avram, he gets up and travels to the land together with his wife, Sarah, who in that time is called Sarai, and with his nephew, Lot. And soon after they arrive in the land, the land is called at that time the land of Canaan. Soon after they arrive, there's a famine, and Abraham and Sarah are forced to travel to Egypt. And Abraham tells the Egyptians that he is the brother of Sarah, because he thinks that they'll harm him if they know that she is his husband, that he is her husband. The Egyptians like the look of Sarah and they take her to Pharaoh's house and Pharaoh and his household then become afflicted with an illness. And Pharaoh then realizes that this is because Sarah is a married woman. And he tells Abraham that Abraham can then take Sarah and go. Avram, Sarah, and Lot then return to the land of Canaan, and the herdsmen of Avraham's livestock and the herdsmen of Lot's livestock have a quarrel, and so therefore they decide that they're going to have to part ways, and Avraham lives in Canaan, and Lot goes to live in the city of Sodom, in which there are living some very wicked people. God tells Avraham that the land of Canaan will belong to his descendants. The next thing that happens is a big war between the various kings in the area. And in the midst of this war, Lot is taken captive. When Abraham hears this, he arms his disciples and he pursues Lot's captors. And he succeeds in bringing back Lot and all the other captives and their possessions. And then one of the kings comes to Abraham and he blesses him for his conduct. And then another king, the king of Sodom, comes to him and suggests that Abraham keep all the possessions, but the captives should be given over to the king of Sodom. But Abraham refuses this suggestion. In the meantime, Abraham is becoming very concerned. He's been promised that he will be the ancestor of a great nation, but he still has no children. And so Hashem reassures him and tells him that he will have as many descendants as the stars he can see in the sky. Hashem then reiterates that Abraham is to inherit the land of Canaan. Abraham asks how he can know that he will indeed inherit it. And what follows is a special covenant ceremony involving various animals and birds. And this ceremony is an expression of the bond between Abraham and God, including the promise of the land. God tells Abraham that his descendants will reside in another land, but they will return to Canaan. Sarah still has no children, so Abraham has a child with his maidservant Hagar. However, when Hagar becomes pregnant, it causes her to look down on Sarah, who is still barren. And Sarah cannot bear this, and she sends Hagar away. But an angel of God comforts Hagar and tells her to return to her mistress. And she's told that her son will become the ancestor of a great nation. Now, we've been referring to Abraham as Abraham, but actually until this point, his name has been Abraham. God now reveals himself and tells him that now he is to be called Abraham. And Sarah, who thus far has been known as Sarai, now her name is changed to Sarah. And God also tells Abraham about the mitzvah of circumcision. And he tells Abraham that Sarah will be the ancestor of a great nation. And Abraham then goes to circumcise his household. And that is our jam-packed cedra of Lech Lecha. Let me just stop to let a bunch of people into the room. Okay, and we'll thanks. unpack with a couple of ideas from our parasha. First of all, reflecting a little bit on what Abraham is known for. What kind of leader, what kind of, what kind of personality was Abraham? Such that he plays this very important role in the history of our people. Why was Abraham chosen? What is the nature of the legacy that Abraham passes on to the Jewish nation? And how should this affect our lives? So Abraham is often seen as the champion of monotheism. Certainly, according to the Midrash, he rebels against his 
idolatrous background to embrace belief in one God. And that, of course, is how he lives his life. He calls out in the name of God. His life is dedicated to God. He's the champion of monotheism. But Abraham is also identified with the character trait of chesed, of loving kindness. Kindness and sensitivity are his calling card. And we see this in the next week's parasha, where God says he's going to destroy the city of Sodom, a city of wicked people. And Abraham calls out on their behalf and says, no, surely there must be some people there who are righteous people. So don't destroy the city. And he argues with God. And of course, there's the equally famous story of Abraham in his tent, the tent which our tradition says was open on all four sides so that every wanderer would be able to find a place to shelter and to eat. And Abraham has just had his bris miller. He's just had his circumcision three days earlier. He's sick and yet he sits out in the tent waiting to find some, some wayfarer, some stranger that he can welcome in and show hospitality to. His own personal discomfort is of no concern as he gazes down the road in the heat of the day, waiting to help some lonely passerby. This is who Abraham is. And that's why in two weeks time, or, uh, we will read that Abraham's servant is sent to find a shidduch, a marriage partner for Abraham's son Yitzchak. And he highlights the criteria of chesed. He looks for a girl who has the characteristic of loving kindness. That will be the one who is right for Yitzhak. And that girl was Rivka, Rebecca, and the rest is history. But we see this tremendously strong theme in Abraham's life of, of kindness and also obviously the strong theme of being devoted to God. And it creates a moment for us to reflect on this twinning of faith and kindness. How do these two things come together? Being devoted to God and being a person of kindness. Surely Abraham's life awakens us to this question as to what is the connection between them. It's interesting that the word chesed, which means loving kindness, appears 245 times in the Torah. About two thirds of those 245 times are speaking of God, God's character and God's actions, because we believe that Hashem is a God of kindness. And so what does it mean to worship a God of kindness? We worship Hashem in part by becoming like Hashem, by becoming ourselves a person of kindness. We identify him with the one who created the world, who gives us all life, who's constantly giving and blessing, who, is te who teaches us the importance of giving to others, who challenges us to work with him to perfect the world and make the world a better place. This is the, the God of Chesed, and to worship the God of Chesed means to be devoted to Chesed, to kindness ourselves. The great Hasidic thinker, Rabbi Menachem Nocham of Chernobyl, asked the question, how do we cling to Hashem? Hashem is all spiritual and we are physical. So how can we get a connection with him? And he answered the question, we get a connection with Hashem by clinging to his qualities, by becoming more like him, by realizing that he is the one who gives so much and striving ourselves to give to give to others, to bless others, just as God conveys his blessing onto us. Another great Hasidic thinker, the Sfat Emet, described this in very powerful metaphorical terms as like a grafting of a branch back onto a tree. We are like a branch on the tree that is Hashem, and we graft ourselves onto that heavenly tree. The more that we engage in kindness, the more we become associated with and deeply connected to Hashem. Or as one great rabbi, Rabbi Volba said, when you love kindness, you become in the image of God. The more that we love kindness, the more in the image of God we are. And this is the legacy and the message of Abraham. Don't think that to be devoted to God is irrelevant to who you are with other human beings. To be devoted to a relationship with God leads you to be more like God, constitutes you being more like God, which involves acts of kindness, love of kindness. In the 19th century, one of the great proponents and exemplars of this idea was Rabbi Yisrael Salanta. Rabbi Yisrael was once on his way to synagogue on Yom Kippur, and he heard 
a baby crying inside a house. So he went into the house and he looked around and he found that there was no adult there. He figured correctly that the mother must have gone to synagogue and left the baby on his own. And so Rabbi Yisrael waited and he stayed with the baby and he comforted the baby on Kol Nidre night. And at the beginning, the congregation waited for the rabbi. Where's the rabbi? We'll wait for him. But eventually they decided to stop the service. He wasn't there. And only when the mother came back from the service, when she returned from synagogue, did Rabbi Yisrael explain to her that it was more important to stay with the baby than to go to synagogue, even on Yom Kippur. Once on Passover, just before Passover, Rabbi Yisrael was, was ill, he was sick. And so he couldn't examine the, the factory to make sure that everything was kosher for Passover. So he sent his students to do that. And his students were very worried. How are we going to ensure all the intricate laws are followed so we can make sure that these matzahs are completely kosher for Passover? And they asked their rabbi, Rabbi Yisrael, is there anything in particular that we should watch out for or be careful of? And Rabbi Yisrael said, yes, be sure that you don't shout at the old lady who works in the matzah factory. In other words, Rabbi Yisrael was a person who had in mind, of course, to be careful with all of the halachot, all of the intricate laws, but he had a vision, he had an understanding based on the, on the life of Abraham, that to be devoted to Torah, to God, to Judaism, requires you to be involved with the practice of and the love of kindness. Just stop to let someone into the Zoom room. One more idea. There's another message from Abraham's life. Abraham later on in next week's parsha reflects Hituoti. He says, God caused me to wander. God caused me to be lost. God caused me to go astray. What does that mean, Hituoti? What does this all mean? It means, according to the commentaries, that when, when God told Abraham to go to the promised land, Abraham wandered from one place to another and he explored different countries. And along the way, he wondered, he wondered if he had reached the right place because God didn't tell him where he was going. And only when he got to the land, eventually, did God then eventually tell him that he got to the correct place. Somehow, Abraham had to figure out himself where the promised land was. And according to our tradition, he goes into the land from the most northern part of the land. But he doesn't settle in the northern valley. He starts making himself through the country. And Rashi explains that Abraham wasn't stopping in the north. He was making his way through the country so he could move towards Yerushalayim, towards Jerusalem, which was in the southern belt. Abraham is finding his way to Israel. Abraham is finding his way to Jerusalem. And the question is, how did he know where to go? What was leading him? And the answer is an answer which is key to Abraham's life and key to understanding his, the legacy that he leaves to us. Is that there's something called Kedusha. Kedusha means holiness. It means sanctity. It means the awareness that there's something higher than us. There's a, an awareness of the presence of God within our world. That's what holiness means. And Abraham's neshama, his soul, was sensitive to this. And not only was he able to discern where God's close presence could be found, but he was attracted to it. When you live your life in a certain way, when you listen with a certain kind of spiritual sensitivity, you gain an awareness of the presence of God and you're attracted to that. You move towards it. You get excited by it. The generation of the flood were excited by beauty and aesthetics. Everything had to be beautiful. And that's what really created a passion, physical beauty. The generation of the Tower of Babel that came after that of the flood, they were all about power and technology. They were excited by the ability of human beings to create things. Abraham brings a different passion to the world. For Abraham, the great attractive force is Kedusha. What should we get passionate about? To pursue those moments, those places, those times, those relationships where you can feel palpably the presence of God. Live your life with that passion. That is part of Abraham's exemplified legacy to us. A life of passion, a life of experience. We should react to Kedusha, to holiness, the way that an eye reacts to a beam of light. We should try to cultivate within ourselves a sixth sense 
not just taste and touch and, and, and hearing and sight and whichever one I, and, and smell, but also a sixth sense which discerns holiness. This is a holy moment. This is a holy prayer and to get an awareness of that. And like a bee which is attracted by the nectar of a flower, we descendants of Abraham are attracted by the presence of God, by the sense of holiness in our world. And so we see that there are two major legacies we've discussed today from Abraham's life, which remain with us, the legacy of devotion to kindness and the legacy of sensitivity to holiness. May we bring this into our lives, especially over this holy Shabbat. And I wish a Shabbat Shalom to Vivian, to Nancy, to Steve, to Hannah, to Diana and to Vivian. And to all those who are watching next week, I wish you all a good week. God bless you.